Excuse me, everyone. We now have our presenters in conference. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Chris Hund. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. This is Chris Hund, uh, Director of the National Implementation of Team Steps Programs. Uh, work at the American Hospital Association for an organization within the AHA called the Health Research and Educational Trust. Really happy to have you here today for the January Team Steps webinar. Uh, this one is uh, from Dr. Oren Gutman from uh, Texas, and we'll hear more about him in a second, but it's called Brain-Based Learning Strategies to Improve Team Steps Deployment and Healthcare High Reliability. Uh, I know I say this every month, but I, I think you will really enjoy this. Uh, heard Oren at our conference last year. He did a great job. People really loved his session. So, Glad to have you all here today. Quick rules of engagement. Um, uh, if you look over in the pod that's on the right where it says notes, you can see uh, throughout how you can access audio. So if you have any problems, you can dial in that number. Uh, if you are just listening through the website, please make sure that you mute your computer speakers so you don't get any funny feedback. Uh, we definitely want you to ask questions. Uh, we encourage you to write questions in the chat pod, which is the one where it says general chat on the bottom right of your screen, right <coughs> under notes. That's a great place to uh, ask us questions throughout. I'll gather them up and do a moderated Q&A with Oren at the end. Uh, you'll also notice a pod at the bottom of the screen that says web links. Those are just some useful links for you to see right now as we bring up things if we want to, you know, it's, it's live and fluid, so if anything gets added throughout and we talk about another website, we'll pop in a link right there for you there. Couple upcoming events, you can register for master training courses uh, just by the 18th, which is next week. We're going to open up courses through June 2017, so get in there and do that if you want to attend. National Conference 2, we've got some uh, spots remaining. Uh, that's in June in Cleveland, a uh, great location right on a lake, right by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the content is uh, really wonderful because it's all put on by people from the Steps community, so you're hearing from your peers, and it, it's a really great time. Uh, and then there's also a call for webinar presenters. Uh, ever have any questions? This is how you contact us, uh, either by phone or email or you could go on over to the website uh, at uh, the uh, AHRQ website. A lot of thanks to AHRQ. They actually fund all of this activity, not only these webinars, but the whole National Implementation Program. So many thanks to all the people at AHRQ, especially our project officer, Dr. Barbara Bartman. Okay, uh, moving on here uh, to today's presenter, like I said, Dr. Oren Gutman from uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, he is the director for multidisciplinary team training. Uh, he has presented and will be presenting at the national conference this year. And Oren, I'm always just surprised at the wide range of your knowledge and all the different things you can present on. So. You really are a Team Step champion, and I'm, I'm looking forward to introducing you to this audience. So take it away. Thank you so much, Chris. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. You all hear me fine now? Quick uh, yes in the chat box. Thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. I, uh, I'm Really, it's my privilege and honor to be with you guys today. I'm going to try and bring together a couple of really interesting ideas that I've come across in my Team Steps deployment here at UT Southwestern, we're in this journey uh, with the AHRQ, and we certainly have had the great benefit of Chris's team and their ability to deliver us this content. So thank you guys for everything that you're doing at the AHRQ. Um, we're going to talk today about a topic which I think is very dear to my heart. It's called uh, brain-based learning strategies. I really want to sort of focus on how we can utilize a more neurocognitive approach to our various team steps deployments in order to help our healthcare system high reliability. So again, welcome from UT Southwestern. That's our flagship uh, Clements University Hospital. And again, yes, we are from Texas, and so, you know, some of us prefer this map, those Texans on the chat box. Um, <coughs> kidding. 
I have nothing to disclose yet, unfortunately. <laughs> um, learning objectives. So it says that the connection was lost. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Lauren, this is Jen. We can hear you. Um, can you advance your slides? I am unable to advance my slides. I'll try again. Sorry. Uh, looks like we're refreshed, and we might be back in just a second. My apology, everybody. Okay, good. I think we're there. Sorry for getting through this. All right, here we go. So again, our learning objectives today, what I'd like to do is use Donald Kirkpatrick's training effectiveness paradigm and sort of take a neurocognitive approach to how we can achieve the various objectives, his K1 reaction, his K2 learning, and his K3 behavioral change, and try and understand the neurocognitive architecture and how we can sort of take advantage of those things to reach those objectives. So I'd like to sort of think about culture change from a brain-based perspective. And Let's just get the definition of terms. Brain-based culture change is the strategy of leveraging our current understanding of the human cognitive architecture to design more successful change paradigms. And so this really comes out of brain-based learning, and there's a lot that's been written on this. Um, think of it like it, changing the brain is really an art. Changing culture is changing a billion brains, and so changing the environment. And so we can sort of utilize many of the lessons that we have, have in, from learning theory, from brain-based learning theory, and potentially be able to design much more effective and efficient culture change paradigms. And so many of you, I am sure, have had the experience of having a really awesome idea and trying to implement it and somehow striking out, and you're sort of left wondering how this great idea simply could not make it. And you wonder, how will the next idea not go the way of the others? Well, if we're going to look at Kirkpatrick's methodology, we sort of, one of the things that I find most interesting about this paradigm is you really have to go iteratively. You have to start with the emotions, then move on to learning, then move on to behavioral change and actions and, and of course, measured results. So anytime we're trying to embed a new paradigm, we sort of can't jump to learning before we've dealt with emotions. And I'm going to try and present a little bit of a case for that. So first thing to sort of recognize, I think, and this, this seems logical to most of us, is that you know emotions are more powerful than logic, although we may not want to admit that. Um, reason and intellect are sort of engaged only once our emotions and our sort of impulse have sort of lost their impetus, right? When people are engaged, they'll do all kinds of crazy things, right? But when they're disengaged, it almost doesn't matter how persuasive something is. If they're simply not there with you, they're not ready to learn and certainly not ready to change their behavior. And so I sort of want to illustrate this. So what I'd like to do, we're actually going to do a quick poll with you guys. So we're going to play a little game. I want you to meet John John. John John is going to lend you some money. And here's the game. You only have two choices. You either play the game, which I'm about to describe, or you can pay $100 in cash right now to not play the game. So again, you, you have to choose one or the other. Here's the game. John John's going to flip a coin. And I'm trying to make this thing flip through. If he flips ahead, you're going to get $10,000 in cash from him right now. If he flips tails, you're going to have to go to the ATM pull out $2,000 and give John John $2,000. Again, that's the game. If you play, heads you win, tails you lose, <clears throat> or you can simply pay $100 right now to get out of this situation and simply, I'm not flipping the coin, no thank you, and I'm walking away. How many of you are interested in playing the game? How many of you are walking away right now?
We're almost there. I think we're almost at all the results. Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it's changing much anymore. Jen, why don't you go ahead and show the results, please? So it, it looks like about 60% of you are not interested in playing the game. You're going to pay 100 bucks. say, thanks, John, John, we're not playing. 40% of you would actually like to play this game. So I'm going to move this guy over to the side. Perfect. So again, 60% of you did not want to play the game. And that's whenever I ask this question to a large audience, it's typically two-thirds, kind of like what we saw, two-thirds don't want to play the game. One-third will. And so what I'd like to do is simply go through a quick analysis with you. Again, most of us have a preference for certainty. We don't like to take risk. And in healthcare in particular, um, various subspecialties have different risk tolerances, but in general, we're sort of risk averse. And sort of maybe the reason why is because a bird in the hand, as you know, you've heard the adage, is better than two in the bush. But really, if we look at this simply purely logically, we can calculate something called an expected value. And, and very simply put, what's the probability of an outcome and what do we expect? So let's play the game as scenario one and see what we should expect. If he throws a heads, you can expect $10,000. The chance of that is 50-50, so that's positive 5,000. If he throws a tails, again, it's not a rigged coin, it's a 50-50 chance, you're going to lose 2,000. Your overall expected value, simply logically, not introducing emotions into the picture, is $4,000. Scenario two, I'm not playing, John, John. Here's 100 bucks. 60% of you said, I'm not playing. That, that's a probability of one. Here's the $100. I'm out. Now, if you look at this purely logically, you should absolutely play the game. And the reason is, is because your expected value is significantly higher to play the game versus not. Yet most of you, like most people I ask this question to, typically will not want to play the game. And the reason is, is this. It hurts more to lose than it does to win. And this principle, I can't un emphasize enough, is so important to address when you start a change paradigm with your staff, and we're going to sort of get into this. If you think about it, we really, some people say there are five primal emotions. I, I sort of am bent towards four. You, and many of you have seen Inside Out. That's a great Disney movie that sort of, you know, sort of characterizes this. You know, you have fear, sadness, anger, and happiness. And if you think about that, you know, when that breaks down, three of those emotions are sort of related to loss. One of them is related to gain. So you sort of understand why, at least from a neurocognitive perspective, you really have to deal with emotional pain before people are prepared to engage. This sort of takes us to, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's been a lot of discussion in the ODT world about this. And I think this is one of the probably the more powerful paradigms in the way I've sort of been able to understand this model and utilize it. You really have to remove demotivators. Demotivators are risky for people. People have risk intolerance, like we saw. It's, you, it's very difficult to ask someone to get engaged when you haven't yet addressed, how is this going to affect my job? How is this going to affect, am I going to lose money or time because of this? Is my work-life balance going to change because of this? My condition is going to change. All of those things are risky to staff. And you sort of have to engage them simply because of loss aversion and the preference for certainty. All of this comes under Kirkpatrick's very first reactionary paradigm. I'll give you a, a tool and an example that sort of helps deal with this issue. It's a, tr it's a study that was actually done by Loftus and Palmer in 74. Did a series of two studies. And forgive me, that it's actually not 100, it's 45. They actually showed a video of a car crash to 45 college students, and they asked them a very simple question. How fast were the cars going when they bumped each other? They then asked a different 45 students, and they simply changed the word. How fast were they going when they smashed into each other? It turned out that the folks who were told smashed simply estimated about nine miles per hour faster than bump. That sort of seems logical. 
But here's what's most interesting to me. In a second experiment, they actually asked them, do you guys remember seeing any glass breaking? And there was no glass breaking in the videos they showed them. The bump group said yes 14% of the time. The smash group said yes 32% of the time. Again, this is a, the power of framing. And framing and the words that we use, they, they have huge impact on our emotions and the way we react to something. Here's an example from the New England Journal of Medicine, very old study. They asked 167 subjects to imagine they had lung cancer. Half were told, you know, of the 100 having surgery, 10 are going to die. 32 will have died by one year, 66 die by five years. Of the 100 getting radonc therapy, none will have died in treatment. 23 die at one year, 78 die at five years. There's a 50-50 split who wanted surgery and radiation. They went and asked a different group, and they changed the verbiage. They simply gave the same statistics but said it differently. 90 are going to survive. 68 will survive at one year. 34 will survive at five years. And they did the appropriate change in radiation therapy. And this time, about 84% wanted surgery. It's a massive change simply by the way something was positively framed. And so here's the take-home point on Kirkpatrick's first paradigm. Number one, don't skip it. We simply have to address people's emotions. I think that's the most common mistake that I see. But you have to sort of get very specific. You have to recognize emotional reasoning. You have to sort of admit that this is very much a part of the human landscape and that loss aversion is real. This means very simply that you have to really adopt and accept transparency. You have to announce things openly. You got to get the myths and the, the sort of hallway talk quieted. You have to sort of take away false reasons and, and really, really clarify for people what the initiative is and why it's being done. And then you can do that by utilizing positive framing, right? You have, and you really should answer at an individual level, not just an organizational level, how's this paradigm going to help this employee on this patient care unit or clinic? How's their work life going to get better? What's going to change for them? And how are they going to get a win out of this? Because when you frame something positively, you're much more likely to get engagement. We're going to move on to Kirkpatrick's second paradigm, which is learning. And what can we do from a neurocognitive perspective to really enhance learning the new way? Well, once we've dealt with the first way, we can move on to learning. With, with reactions, we can move on to K2, which is learning. So let's just define successful learning in a broad sense, right? It's encoding and storage of information. We want to retrieve and retain that information, certainly understand it and be able to extrapolate. Ultimately, we want to have that information integrated with everything else we know and be able to project that information as necessary. And so from a brain-based perspective, you need to have three conditions met to optimize learning. And this is sort of our roadmap for learning, which I'm going to sort of walk you down. We call this brain-based learning because we deal with something called orchestrated immersion, relaxed alertness, and active processing. And I'll explain these things in detail. We want to engage your entire sensorium when we learn something. Many of us have had the unfortunate experience of having to click through a PowerPoint to check off on something. It is a painful experience. That's not orchestrated immersion. Orchestrated immersion means literally we set up an environment and immerse you in the learning. We also want to make sure that you are relaxed during that state, that we've activated your emotions, that you're not too stressful, that you're not overly exerted, but that you're balanced, you're awake enough, and you're engaged enough to actually be able to encode memory, and we'll talk about that. We want to also, and this is maybe the most important part, we have to actively engage in what's called deliberate practice or deliberate mindfulness. And that's where we actually go through a process of active processing. So let's take a dive into this together and see what we can do to optimize it. Ultimately, our goal for orchestrated immersion is something called epicytic memory. Epicytic memory is sort of personalized memory. It sort of brings together all of the various details of an experience, the context and the content. It's sort of a holistic approach. It encodes and enables you to retrieve and store information that's contextual. Um, different parts of your brain are sort of involved in how epicytic memory gets 
created. But just to give you a, an example, many of us have very, very vivid memories of various experiences that we've had along our training, right? There's some things that stand out more than others. That's an example of an epicytic memory. You, you might be able to describe what you were wearing that day or what the OR looked like or what your teacher was um, talking about or, or you know, the, the smell in the room at the time. All of these cues get sort of encodified in an epicytic memory, and that's really our goal because those are the types of memories that we can pull up much easier than declarative facts, which are sort of difficult. We want it to be contextualized. So that's where we're going. That's the goal of this type of immersion. So there's something called the seductive detail effect, which you should be aware of. What is this? So when information is introduced to learners, that's interesting, but really is unrelated to the learning objectives. It could be photos, illustrations, sounds, music. You're talking about a certain topic and the teacher or the, um, the presenter goes off on a tangent which really has nothing to do with the objectives per se, or it could be tangentially, maybe tangentially related. That's called seductive details. It sort of pulls you in a direction because it's interesting, but it may not have specific impact on the learning objectives of that particular paradigm. What happens when you do this? Well, this anecdotal information can actually present sort of extra weight. If you think of your brain like a weightlifter and the load is the weight, and your brain's the cognition, this extraneous sort of unrelated weight can really be taxing on your short-term memory and your ability to, to form long-term epicytic memory. Turns out, actually, that specifically for very complex tasks, um, it's actually particularly detrimental. It's also detrimental when it's done at the beginning of a lesson. Um, it's also uh, challenging, for instance, um, to, to actually be able to have self-assessment and, and true self-reflection, which we refer to as metacognition, when, you're, when you have seductive detail. One thing it does do is occasionally improve motivation when, when things are particularly boring or dry. Moving on to the next aspect of learning, which is called relaxed alertness. And this is really where you know, we want people to be up here in their cortex. We want folks to be using their, their, their sort of thought part of their brain and not their fight or flight midbrain. And many times, if you're overly stressed, right, you can literally have your midbrain hijack your cortex, right? Your amygdala can literally take over. We call that downshifting in learning and in the simulation world that I live in. And it's sort of like where you're simply unable to think because of the fight or flight response that you have. Performance and stress are very much related, as I think most of us sense and know. You know, you can be overly stressed and perform poorly, or you can be completely unmotivated. We want you to be sort of this relaxed alertness, kind of this zone right over here. And, you know, there's certainly a way to do that. Sorry, I'm just clicking through here. You know, it turns out that many of the hormones of stress actually inhibit attention and perception and short-term memory. And so there's really a biologic basis for this. It's not something that's fluffy. If people are too stressed out, it, cre it really does create a problem in their learning. So you sort of have to ask the question, what stresses people out and when they're trying to learn? And for most people, it's making a mistake. <clears throat> people don't like to make mistakes. They fear making mistakes and errors. So there's a theory out there, which I'd like to introduce you to, which basically takes errors and tries to frame them positively. I, I simply love this cartoon. I, I showed it to my kids, and they kind of crack, they crack up from it. Yeah, it it's really taking errors, and instead of error avoidance, it's really it, embracing errors and framing them, again, back to framing positively. And this theory is called error management theory. And so I'm going to sort of describe it to you and then give you a very powerful example. I think really one of the foremost thinkers about this is Etienne Drault. He's a neurocognitive psychologist out of England. He's published tremendously about this. If you simply type in his name, you'll see 10, 15 papers on this topic. And so this is a strategy that promises to improve long-term retention, the emotional resiliency of your learning, the ability to contextualize your learning. And rather than avoid errors, it simply looks to embrace errors as part of the learning process teach folks how errors, how things can go wrong before you teach them how to teach them to detect errors, identify errors, before you teach them how to avoid and recover from errors. 
So it literally flips learning on its head. And so the way that we do this is <clears throat> because of something called misattribution fallacy. We don't like to point out errors in ourselves. We start out with these two boxes. We point them out in others. It could be done with a video. It could be done by simply watching um, or, or just in, in, in the ether talking about what others might do. And you start with obvious errors. And you frame them positively. That's great. What else can go wrong? Fantastic. And really reinforce them and, and, and frame them positively. Then you move on to more subtle things. Right. Once we've done that, you then move on to error detection in yourself. And that might be after looking at a video like uh, football players do or, or many surgeons do when they review tape. And you look for obvious and then subtle. And then you would teach what's called error recovery and how you detect it and avoid it or recover from it. Sorry, overclicked. So here's sort of how it works. <clears throat> this first phase is error detection in others. You might use videos or simulations or games. Um, you're trying to get the learner to simply get as many as they can. Well, how many errors can you detect? And you encourage them and you reinforce them positively. We'll talk about how you can help with this by using what's called the character effect we're about to get into. The second phase is a little bit more subtle, right? You want to have them sort of progress in their ability to detect errors. When errors are not detectors, learners get more information on how to detect them. Again, always framing it positively and reinforcing it constantly with positive feedback for the detection of an error. Um, all the errors have to be represented, not just mistakes, but also slips and rule-based errors. Once we've done it in others, we can do it in ourselves, and we move on to sort of obvious to subtle. Things that you can do for subtle are asking folks to maybe compete as groups for total numbers detected. My groups have a lot of fun when we do this. You can create sabotage or distraction. You can use time pressure or speed to recognition rather than of recognition. These are all different ways to just be creative about being able to detect subtle errors in self. And then finally, once we've done this, we can help learners by giving them checklists and, and sort of helping them work through the interventions that are necessary to recover from error. So I'll give you a very wonderful study done by Dr. Gardner here at UT Southwestern. This is a study that looked at central venous cannulation. They actually taught learners how to put in IJs and, and subclavian lines. They looked at skill retention and transfer. At 30 days, they actually asked them to do a task which they were not originally trained on, to put in a femoral line. And here's what they did. They simply had two groups, one that was taught classically how to avoid errors, and the other group was taught how to embrace errors and was taught about error detection. Here's what they found. As you can imagine, the group that was taught simply classically, this is how you do the procedure, avoid doing this, avoid doing that. At one day, the group's really not different. But at 30 days, the error group was much better, statistically significant, it was powered to show this, that they actually were able to retain their learning longer. This was actually true as well for the subclavian line. But I think this is perhaps the most interesting part of this study. When they went back and asked them then to do it on a femoral line, which they were not originally taught exactly how to do, the error group actually was able in a variety of complication scenarios, by and large was able in the first and the second scenario, not so much in the second, but overall was able to detect and deal with errors much better than was the original group. Again, showing transferability and management of error here. Very powerful study. We've incorporated this into our ACLS training. And so typically before I'll do an in situ simulation, I will give out an error, ACLS error sheet, and I'll actually have our, co our, our participants actually watch us run the worst code they've ever seen. We use a video, sometimes we do it live. And we simply ask them to circle as many errors as they can. Again, errors and others. Once we actually do, we, we will debrief that and prime them with the errors. And once they do their own simulation, we use a video-based debriefing. And we then get them to point out obvious and subtle errors in themselves, and at which point we teach them recovery. We, this is also utilized in a just-in-time learning paradigm where we simply go in and teach folks a specific task. In this example, I gave you a bag mask 
ventilation and the different varieties of errors that might happen there, whether they're in equipment utilization or technique. Same concept. You can go in there and ask folks to point out errors in yourself and you're in the, the team teaching and then have them do it with each other and point out subtle, <clears throat> obvious, and then subtle errors in themselves. It's a great way to teach. Folks are much more engaged in this than sort of typical show me how to do it right. That sort of bores people. The last part of um, active learning for Patrick's second paradigm is to think about reflection. And many of you, I imagine, are, are, have touched or have experienced um, some form of simulation, so this is not something that's uh, really foreign to you. But this sort of active processing, this active mindfulness, is sort of a proactive process. You, know, you really have to help the learner think about their frames of reference and make connections with the ideas and the concepts. And you can do that during the, the, the actual learning event or, or afterwards two types of reflection. You know, there, you, people won't be ready to reflect and learn unless they're obviously alert, but also they feel safe. And this sort of goes back to that point I was making earlier, which is unless you've dealt with people's emotional reactions, don't bother trying to teach them anything. Don't, it's not going to work. They may comply for a short amount of time, but eventually they will drift simply because you haven't yet addressed their emotion. But when you have, and you actually go through active reflection, which in this case is referred to as debriefing, the actual score on non-technical skills, right, this is just one scoring algorithm, algorithm called ANT, it's much more effective with active reflection on action than without reflection. This group had no reflective practice, these groups did, so they used either oral or video. It really doesn't seem to matter much. But without any reflection, you actually don't get significant change in learning. I'm going to quickly skip through these two slides simply, be, simply because I wanted to get here for the sake of time. So how do you optimize cognitive load, right, the weight of what people have to learn? Well, if it's a difficult subject, break it up, right? That makes sense. Um, if the subject matter itself isn't so difficult, but the way it has to be presented is difficult, then simply try and avoid redundancy because you're going to saturate your learners. They're going to feel overwhelmed. If the subject's not particularly difficult and uh, it's just simply unclear how it relates and integrates with the rest of your knowledge, then you may want to consider <clears throat> a different strategy altogether, which simply is more of a problem-based approach. You sort of have to understand what the cognitive load is on the learner and match the learning strategy. Here's one strategy which I think is particularly useful. It's referred to as the caricature advantage effect. It comes out of the facial recognition literature. And basically, this is an idea where, you know, our brain looks to clump things together and make these ideas and schematas. And it looks for, it's a really incredible pattern matching ability that we have and when you're able to sort of differentiate two objects or two concepts from each other, our brain is much better at picking up those objects when you can differentiate them. And so this caricature advantage effect, what it basically does is it simply looks to systematically distort and take advantage of differences between various points of a learning paradigm. You want to sort of exaggerate the distinctiveness of what makes things different. Um, how they're different, how and, and why they're different. And by doing this, <clears throat> it turns out that you'll actually help folks learn and be able to much more accurately pick up information, and they'll pick it up faster. And again, maybe if you think about, this is a whole other lecture and topic, but really what is the difference between an expert and a novice? Many folks think that, again, this is one part of a larger discussion, that experts are simply from a cognitive perspective able to discriminate with much more narrow definitions, right? And so if you're able to help learners, particularly novel, novice learners, distinct, sort of know the distinctiveness between two things, you can speed up their learning. Here's a really good example. It's a little bit complex, but I think it's something that is worth sort of presenting just for the general concept. There's a study that ETL did <clears throat> where he looked at airplanes that looked very, very heterogeneous, Clearly, they look very different here, right? Small wings, triangular wings. This one has sort of really long wings. This one looks like 
almost no space between the wings, versus homogeneous aircraft. And again, these all have this bifurcated tail here. And you can imagine if you're on a naval destroyer and, you know, this is a, an enemy war aircraft and this is our aircraft, you know, they, they look really similar flying in the sky at, you know, six 700 miles an hour. And so you may, you may want to think about, well, could that relate maybe to a clinical paradigm where things look really similar, for instance, in diagnosis, and there's specific things that differentiate them. So ETL simply wanted to take advantage of this caricature effect, and he took all these photos, and he simply, by 25%, magnified their distinctiveness, and then asked learners to learn them, and how quickly could they recognize them. And so here's what happened. Two groups, some had enhanced images and some did not. And they basically were asked the speed of identification. They went through a learning period where they showed the, the various uh, parts of the aircraft and in different positions and different frames. And they were asked to simply identify uh, the various images. And here's what they found. What they basically found was you can imagine, right, that airplanes that <clears throat> were different from each other were recognized faster. That's simply logical than those airplanes that look the same. But what's most interesting is that when you had enhanced images, right, during the learning and the testing phase versus original images, which were not characterized, the distinctiveness was not changed, look at the difference between these points. They reach incredible statistical significance. And again, this is an example of what's referred to as a caricature advantage effect. I think one of the take-home points from this is that when we're teaching new paradigms to people, we have to differentiate it and sort of characterize it from the, the new way from the old way. We don't always show how things are different. We simply roll out a bundle or roll out, roll out a package and um, simply not differentiate why it's different or which new steps are there from the old way. And if you want to accelerate learning, we really need to characterize things. Curriculum design certainly has a lot to learn from this, I think, in general. Metacognition I've made reference to, and simply this is where we ask learners to think about the way that they're thinking, right? And so there's a variety of ways we do this, coaching and goal setting and deliberate practice, which I've sort of made reference to now. But let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into coaching. And just as a quick definition, this is sort of a social interaction, right, that aims to enable a learner to gain self-awareness and metacognition about their current state and how they can improve by helping them set very structured goals. It's supposed to be constructive. It's not corrective. It's not feedback. <clears throat> it sort of utilizes inquiry and, and tries to get into why the learner chose something, not what they chose. And so there's a point here I think that needs to be made. Many, many, I think I've seen in the last year at least 10 different papers that have tried to address physician engagement. And so I think a very, maybe a pearl that I've come across is, you know, it's really difficult to, physicians in general, I think as a cohort, they, they really want to make sure that they appear competent. And this paper by Greenberg really does a great job at sort of iterating this. They don't want to be pointed out and coached in public. They would rather be coached in private. And so video-based coaching has a huge role, I think, in the ability to help folks work past their shortcomings and, and helps them and enables them to be Gain, to have gained metacognition about their practice. Experts in general seem to prefer this type of reflection rather than sort of a group reflection where there's an ability to be coached based on their own performance but where they can slow it down and, and maintain their appearance of competency. We've talked a little bit about deliberate practice and just for the sake of just a quick example about this, for instance, this might be when we do simulation as an example, we often give folks um, what are the roles that you're going to need during a code. And we'll actually hand them a handout and just sort of prime them with what their, would be the expectation for them and have them 
deliberately be mindful about this. And we've seen when we do this versus when we don't, we definitely get more of these roles assigned than when we, than when we ask them to go at it without being primed. One way that you can help folks gain metacognition, this is what's referred to as the NASA Task Load Index. We often, in, before we start a debriefing, we'll hand this out and ask our learners, what, did, what role did you play? And we'll ask them to be reflective and help them work through and give them some structure to help them gain self-awareness. Again, this is a tool that is, you know, when utilized correctly, can also help you sort of map out and help learners learn over time, are they, are they, is their cognitive load really changing? And I'm going to move on now simply to actions. We have, looks like we have about 10 minutes left towards questions. So I'm going to sort of um, hone in a, a little bit about Kirkpatrick's third paradigm. We're really not going to get to the fourth today. Um, I probably will talk about this at the AHRQ. Um, today we're going to be talking about this last part, which is behavior. So how, how do we get folks, once we've addressed their emotions, once we um, have utilized brain-based learning to actually embed them with best practices in learning, and we've shown that they've learned, we've shown that they're engaged, how do we now get them to change their behavior? Well, it turns out that there's a whole lot of literature about this. And I guess you might use a different term for behavioral change and think about it as persuasion. Have I persuaded you to change your practice? Being persuaded doesn't always mean you'll act on it. But it, we, without being persuaded, you certainly won't act on it. And so, you know, this Rogers diffusion tells us that the early majority will learn by watching early adopters. The late majority will learn by interacting with the early majority. You have to have observability. You also have to make it easy to try. You have to make it almost um, in vogue or socially acceptable to try. And again, risk tolerance is very much about that very first part of Kirkpatrick's paradigm, but all of these groups have different risk tolerances. Clearly, the laggards are the least risk tolerant, and these innovators are the most risk tolerant. But is there some secret sauce to actually move this paradigm forward? And it turns out that when you look at the social influence literature, there is. Um, it's really mimicry, and <clears throat> we can learn a lot by taking a sort of a, a lesson out of the social influence playbook. Let's define it. Social influence sort of primes us for action. It's change in an individual's thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and behaviors that are going to result from interaction with another individual or a group. So I'm wondering, have you ever sort of seen Someone cough in a room, and then all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of people start coughing, or one or two people start coughing, and before that, it was dead silent. Or someone goes towards a candy bowl, and for the last hour, no one's touched it, and now a bunch of people are going towards the candy bowl. Or, you know, someone rubs their eye, and all of a sudden, a bunch of people are like, yeah, I feel itchy too. You know, believe it or not, there's actually a neurological basis for this. It has to do with something called mirror neurons in your brain. This used to be a theory. Now it's a fact. We've actually proven this. And so a mirror neuron is a neuron that fires when an animal acts or when it observes the same action performed by another. And that neuron simply mirrors the behavior of the other, as though the observer were themselves acting. And what this means practically is that by watching others do a behavior, the activation of your sensory and motor neurons, doing an action yourself, becomes much more likely because of this concept that neurons that sort of fire together, that wire together, fire together, or that fire together, wire together. Forgive me, I <clears throat> tongue twisted. Let me give you, again, some neurological background to this without getting too, too, too grossly detailed here. It turns out that, and they've shown this, that being mimicked actually is, re is positively rewarded in your brain. There's very specific areas that actually activate on fMRI when you're being mimicked. And certain fields have already figured this out. You may have experienced this. You know, in law school, almost every major law school teaches mimicry as a tool in negotiation. Folks who get mimicked in negotiation very subtly are much better and more successful negotiators. Um, in sales, they're well aware of this. There are multiple studies. I just quoted one here. Literally getting folks to <clears throat> feel more trusted more safe in order to engage in buying something 
by simply mirroring the customers. My question to the group is do you think there's a way we can utilize this in order to engage our staff to follow a different behavior? And in fact, I believe there is. So how many of you have bought a song on, on you know, Google or, or iTunes? And you've sort of noticed here on the right this little popularity sign. And it's funny, the more popular a song gets, the more it's bought. Um, something goes viral. Right? A movie goes viral. People um, share some information about something and it, it sort of explodes on social media. The reason is is because you know, it turns out that we're very susceptible to social influence. We're sort of wired for it in a really weird way. Um, and conformity actually seems to have, seems to have a, a hugely rewarding effect. And so my question is in some fictitious hospital, you know, why not um, utilize this? Instead of just dealing with classic transparency, right, where some institutions are further along than others in this, why not actually utilize competition, right, and in terms of trying to get to some benchmark standard? And in, in doing so, we sort of utilize mimicry in that regard. It turns out that um, when they've actually looked at this, it's much more rewarding in your brain to cooperate than it is to resist. And so when you think about that, you may be able, through peer-to-peer -peer recognition boards that many of you have heard about, or through a variety of folk, ways of in, including increased transparency, being able to activate and show, here's what others are doing. You make it more triable. You make it more observable. You make it more safe. Others are much more likely to come along. So again, I'm, I'm almost at the uh, 1250 mark where I agreed with Chris and Jen that I was going to stop. I'm going to go ahead and I don't have another slide here to show. I'm going to go ahead and stop now and, and thank you for your attention and for making the time to, to listen to this. I hope you, you were able to take something out of it. I want you to know that you know this sort of venue is always a challenge for me, but I'm actually willing and, and certainly please contact me. Here is my information. I'm happy to answer any further questions after, after today's short Q&A period, and, and just thank you so much for your attention, and I really appreciate you all being here with me. Thank you. Thanks, Oren. Thank you very much for that presentation. I do have a few questions that have come in for you to answer. Uh, the first uh, is uh, in relation to some of your uh, discussion here on influencing behavior, and, and it was, somebody was curious if you are familiar with the uh, Vital Smarts book called The Influencer, and their, their model, their six-cell model of influencing behavior, and if so, what your thoughts were relative to what you're presenting today? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm actually turning my head and looking at the book now. Um, it's, it's on my desk of, of two reads. I've actually read some related material, but not Influencer directly. Those authors I've also written Crucial Conversations and Crucial Accountability, which I'm a huge fan of. And so I am in the process of making my way towards that book. But certainly I appreciate that it's, it's certainly gained some segue. And, and I, yeah, I, I've heard it's a very good book. I have not read it. All right, sounds good. Uh, somebody else said, I really like the concept of error detection as an exercise with a group. Do you have any non-clinical examples to use for this, uh, such as the airplane example? I can see this being very effective in leadership training sessions, which includes staff from all departments in the organization, and not all these people are clinical folks. Thank you for the awesome question. So part of what I do with high reliability here is sort of move towards zero errors. A huge part of that is professionalism. And so there is early discussion here about creating error management professionalism videos and having new onboarding, an, an onboarding paradigm where learners would get a checklist. And instead of telling folks, here's what we expect of you, have them watch a series of videos of really bad, badly handled situations where, again, we detect errors in others, start out with the obvious, and then move towards the subtle and then give folks the opportunity to actually go through a standardized patient simulation or two and help them use the same checklist for error detection in themselves. 
So I see, an, I see, to answer your question, absolutely. I see a future in this, in leadership training and professionalism training and conflict resolution training. We do a little bit of that. We have a communications, critical safety communication module based on the Team Steps module that we sort of blown up here at UT. And it's, it's a four-hour workshop. And in that workshop, we incorporate a variety of, you know, standardized drills and I, I call them simulations, but really they're, they're really more drills where we have a context and we have folks practice tools by watching first a poorly run drill and then trying to correct it themselves with error recovery. So yes, I think that there's a huge future in that. Thanks for the great question. <clears throat> so what is your, thinking back to when you started working with uh, you know, simulation in general, or, or maybe you were starting to teach people on team steps, was there a point where you weren't considering all of this brain-based learning? And was there any sort of difference between the before and the after? Um, I apologize, because can you rephrase the question? I, I didn't Not a problem. Uh, so I'm thinking that, you know, you're very much, uh, this has been very successful for you, and this is how you uh, train people in a lot of different clinical aspects in your Sim Center, correct? Yes, we, I mean, we, we are now, we started, we're starting to incorporate it more, absolutely. So is there a time before uh, in your career where you weren't using these theories you presented today? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I understand. And how did that change? How did yeah. that change your... <clears throat> oh, fantastic. Okay, okay. Yeah. absolutely. So, you know, for about five years, I've been training anesthesiology residents um, in simply part of, their part of their curriculum is how to recognize and, and sort of recover from bad things happening in the operating room. And so, you know, we've, we've gone through a variety of simulations that we've created for this. Um, some of them have focused mostly on error avoidance. But I, I think at some point, I would say probably halfway through my time with the residents when I was doing that sort of mainly, my partner and I in, in crime decided that we were going to try and work with um, helping folks recover from errors. Not so much about error detection, much more about error recovery. And it sort of got me into a little bit of um, thought about, you know, we teach a lot about trying to avoid errors, and that, that's important. But, you know, errors are going to happen many times out of our control simply because the more I learned about human factors, the more I recognize that humans are going to be valuable, and then systems are going to be valuable, and it's sort of like these errors are going to happen in some regards, whether we like it or not. It's just about mitigating risk rather than completely eliminating risk. And so, maybe if we could teach them to detect errors quicker and recover quicker, we would do better. And when we started to build our simulations around that, I think we, we, we saw a change that was tangible, also in the engagement of the learners. I hope that answers the question. It sort of, it did evolve, because I, I certainly wasn't taught this way. That certainly did answer the question. I was, I was just curious, since I know that it's something that's a little bit more cutting edge. Uh, since it is, we are talking about an innovative way of training others, I, I kind of think that you're probably already looking ahead to what's next. So what's on the horizon, or have you thought, have you thought that far? Yeah, so it's, um, <clears throat> I appreciate the question. So I think right now, you know, we're really working on high reliability. That's our focus, uh, my group's focus. And so what we're trying to do now is use error management theory to sort of embed, and, and, and many of the concepts that I shared with you is literally what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, in how we engage staff in, uh, in, to create psychological safety. We want folks to recognize that, you know, when we come with a simulator or with a just-in-time opportunity or when we do a workshop on trust or, or just culture, what we're trying to do is to give them an opportunity to embrace errors, call out errors, and then learn to detect them and recover from them. And so, again, when we, for instance, when we do, which I think is our most successful uh, workshop here, which is Team Steps, 
we will typically talk about failure modes in communication before I introduce CUS and Two Challenge and SBAR and DESK. We will, we will first help folks be primed to errors. And so the future, I think, is trying to compartmentalize this type of training, which seems to be a little bit more immersive. Is there a way to deliver this more efficiently? And, and we're playing with different paradigms for that now. Thanks. So I could imagine that this really has to help with burnout then too. Not only is it helping cut down on errors, but cutting down on those errors has to help people be more resilient. That, that is certainly our goal is to increase resiliency. Um, and I think that, you know, my, my gut is telling me that, you know, when you make errors um, safer and you take away the anxiety around creating errors and, and learning, then I think what I've seen is there's a lot more just emotional engagement. I think that it depends also on which cohort you're, you're working with. You know, when you're dealing with uh, trainees and house staff versus faculty versus medical students, nursing students, um, it, it, it's very different. I think different learners certainly have different preferences um, and also different tolerances to what they want to sort of focus on in terms of error detection or error recovery, um, but but we can we usually feel where they are on that spectrum and and try and customize the learning to what part of it they are most interested in learning about. As long as they're either focusing on error detection or error recovery, I find that it's a lot more engaging than simply teaching someone error. All right, thank you. One more question. Uh, so can we have a clinical example of the caricature effect, uh, similar to what you had said about the airplanes, but in a clinical mode? Absolutely. I'll, here's a really good one. So all of us who work in hospitals have to be able to deal with malignant hyperthermia. Um, we've got MH carts everywhere um, in the preoperative, operative area, and I believe also in the emergency room. And so as an example, there is a sort of a look-alike um, to MH, which is serotonin syndrome. And what I, what I do when I teach folks about MH is to point out to them, as an example, among many other things, that when you paralyze someone with serotonin syndrome, you know, their muscles react differently than when you paralyze someone with MH. And MH, the reaction to paralytic, they still remain rigid, whereas in serotonin syndrome, they do not. They get paralyzed. And so the, you're sort of um, really sort of defining differently. Um, so you're teasing out a difference to help with, di with sort of diagnosis. Um, I'll give you another example. When I deal with ICU folks, and we're trying to differentiate between right heart failure and abdominal compartment syndrome, we'll sort of point out to them the changes in peak airway pressures and plateau pressures uh, in one and not in the other, right, in abdominal and not in right heart. And so, again, many, many um, types of examples like this. Sometimes it's procedural um, where we'll point out in this case, in this patient, this would be considered an error, and then and this is how you differentiate it. If you're putting in a line, for example, and you're trying to know whether you're in an artery or a vein, in a liver failure patient, their CVP might be 30, and so checking with a manometer there would be an error, whereas in a normal patient, it would not. So we, we sort of try and really tease out differences, and we characterize them and, and really distinguish them. I found also, and I've, the feedback that I've got is, for instance, you know, when you're teaching about even Foley placement, um, if you're teaching a new way to someone who's been doing this for 30 years, it's different than when you're doing it, teaching someone who's done it for two years. Um, you're asking them to change their muscle memory. So you really have to take advantage of everything you can. That's great. Thanks, Oren, and, and thank you, everybody, for being on today. This really concludes today's uh, Team Steps webinar. We will be sending out an evaluation so after this, so please, for, uh, it's very useful to everybody, so please 
fill that evaluation out when you receive it. Uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you, Orrin. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jen. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your phone line and log off of your webinar. Speakers, one moment.